warm welcome to everybody on this uh, today's discussion on contract farming in most countries of the world a farmer basically says to himself that here is my piece of land i am willing to put in the effort but i do not want the risk of the market i want to know that if i have a product 3 months down the line i want a fixed price for it and i do not want to assume the risk of the weather which is where contract farming comes in so in our today's panel we are going to discuss as to whether something of this sort is possible in myanmar whether it is already being done in myanmar and what is it that needs to be done to take it to the next level uh we have a very interesting panel of uh, of speakers and i will take it that their bios have been read by the viewers so i'm not going to spend time uh, discussing that and i go to my first question which is to david david you've been contracting with farmers in south africa can you walk us through the process as to how this happens from the time that you actually express interest of contracting with the farmer and what are the points that you need to be careful of while preparing the agreement thanks so just unmute myself thanks uh, but so thanks to everybody for for having me on this panel um the process in south africa is a it's a it's a fairly simple process in that uh we we treat it almost as a as a transactional buy and sell agreement obviously between us and the grower where we will fix it, we will fix the price for a particular commodity uh we will then give the uh, grower a formal written agreed contract for the particular commodity obviously at that agreed fixed price it will stipulate the payment terms it will stipulate all of the details that the farmer needs to know and needs to understand what we require for the contract um on certain occasions we will even go so far as to finance the seed for that particular farmer uh it stops there we don't finance anything other than the seed we we're, we're not in the, the input uh, business and on the back of that contract with many south african banks the farmer is then able to even in fact go and get a uh, um, funding to grow that crop the farmer then grows the crop he will then deliver it back to uh, any one of our nominated uh, delivery points once the once the crop has been delivered to us we then deduct the seed cost if that has been in fact uh, uh, financed by us and we will then take uh, take the goods and uh, obviously take them to market the the key uh, comfort levels i guess when it comes to contract farming is that you want to make sure that you as as the buyer are contracting with a a secure business unit Now a secure business unit in terms of a farm in South Africa is somebody who's got some sort of uh, title to his land he's got some sort of asset base and you can see that they're a fairly strong established uh, 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 operation you don't want to be in a situation where you're writing contracts with people who've essentially got nothing to lose because ultimately uh, you're putting yourself and the contract at risk and another key i would say to contract farming is that you want to try as much as you can to develop long term relationships with your growers because that ultimately puts everybody in a position of comfort <clears throat> thank you david i think from what you said it's very important to have a contract which is as watertight as possible and you know to that extent the role of the government is very important so i'd like to ask shona shona based on your experience you you're obviously an expert a legal expert when it comes to uh, grain trade agreements what is the role of the government in terms of being an enabler and what sort of a framework does a government need to install in the ecosystem to make sure that the buy and sell agreements can proceed uh, pretty seamlessly yeah hi vatsal thank you for having me and uh, good afternoon see the government needs to provide of facilitation and the government needs to provide data the government needs to provide a framework for undertaking contract farming you know uh, i was looking up some statistics and uh, pepsico undertook contract farming in punjab and uh, the data of that is available on uh, the national institute of agricultural extension management in india in india 
and PepsiCo used technology to achieve yields of three to four tons per hectare in groundnut as against the national average of one ton per hectare in groundnut. And in as far as chili is concerned, PepsiCo achieved a yield of 20 tons per hectare as against the average before contract farming uh, of six tons per hectare. And even in tomatoes, they achieved a yield of 52 tons per hectare. So this is the real effect of contract farming. It's not a situation where two plus two is four. It's a situation where two plus two is five. It's a winning situation for all the parties concerned. The farmer gets a better income. The land utilization is more optimal and it results in uh, more money for everyone, basically. So contract farming is really something which should be looked at, especially by the government by providing a framework enabling contract farming. The government should not put restrictions on it. Government should not say you have to do this, you have to do that, or this is how you go about doing things. It should just be permissive. It should give the ultimate choice to the farmer as to what they want to do and the, the choice to the company as to what they want to do. There should be freedom in that regard. Now you see alternative dispute resolution is a very important means of resolving disputes that arise in contract farming because you know as david mentioned they want to they you know they always corporates and buyers they always want to be in a contract with someone who has something has some skin in the game so that's where you know alternative dispute resolution becomes very important you know it's, it's not always feasible it's not always viable to go to court and when the government provides a framework for alternative dispute resolution and provides you know legal sanctity to that that really creates an atmosphere where disputes are minimized the government is still involved in the game so as to ensure that no party is taken advantage of like a small farmer who should not be taken advantage of he should not lose his land the parameters should be set out as to how to go about resolving these disputes, the government should provide data as to the credit worthiness of these small farmers. You know, like as David mentioned, you know, he always, obviously any, anyone wants to be in a contract with someone who has some skin in the game, but just merely if you have a lot of land or maybe you don't have a lot of land, that's just one indicator of whether you have skin in the game. It does, that's not the only indicator. You may, you may have, a, you know, there are situations now where you have vertical farming and you have different types of methods of farming where there are some farmers who have achieved, you know, insane amounts of yield from a very small amount of land. So if, if you just say, well, he doesn't have enough land, I'm not going to contract with him. That doesn't make sense because he could be achieving yields which are 10 times better than someone who has, you know, five times the amount of land that he has. And the technology that that farmer is using could be very different. And, you know, the way uh, we have looked at innovation in farming, this is really something that the government should just enable. We don't need the government to do anything for the farmer. We just need them to provide a framework where the facility and the information is available and they can connect the farmer and the contract uh, company. Shana, thank you so much. I think you basically said it as to what the role of the government should be as an enabler. And to that extent, I'd like to go to Wu Tao Han, who is, of course, uh, an expert here in Myanmar. Do we already have a contract farming law in Myanmar? And uh, can you also give us an idea as to whether any corporates have engaged in this and what their experiences have been? Over to you, Wu Tao Han. So there is a law in Myanmar that uh, for the protections of the farmer rights and enhancement of their benefits, uh, which was enacted back in 2013. And last year, uh, 31st January 2020, our government have uh, you come up with the directive or rules, a set of rules, you know, which will regulate the, this, the contract farming uh, agreements. Like, 
So which, which include the nine set of rules for the farmers. So 10 set of rules for the company and then another nine set of rules for the concern government ministerial uh, department. So in which the, the, the nine set of rule for farmers uh, are like, you know, the, the entitlements of the lands, they must have a solid ownership of the land uh, and they must work uh, in a group, uh, like minimum five farmers have to work together and can be up to 10, 15, yeah. So another, another points are like they have to understand the agreement and framework they made with the company. So these, these are the set of rules for farmers. For the company, so they, the company have to make sure they are, they are supplying the quality seeds and uh, imports, chemical, pesticide, yeah, fertilizer, etc. So they, they, they are up to the uh, standard best, you know. Another thing is uh, so they, they, they have to buy the produce at the fixed agreed price when, when they are harvested. So that another point is in case of advanced, adverse weather events, uh, the farmer have lost their crop and then the contract will be renegotiated, negotiated. So like, like such kind of risks are like we put into the company, not on the farmer. So these are the set of rules for the uh, company. And then another nice set of rules for concerned government ministry departments include like they have to provide technical assistance and then they have to monitor the, the companies are providing quality seeds and, and agricultural imports as they promised. They have to monitor and with which they are according to the agreed contract and facilitations, provide facilitation between these two parties. So these are the set of rules outlined in the last year, this uh, the right date. So which were which will be become a, like like a law, you know, in in our country. So this is the situation in in Myanmar. Yeah. So previously the the contract farming, like in some cases, are like formal. In some cases, are informal. There's a happening, but but mostly are informal, partly formal and partly informal. So that's just what's happening currently in our country. Yeah. Yeah, Uthan, can you give us an idea as to what needs to be done to take it to the next level? I mean, where are we missing something? So actually, this set of rules are like quite enough for, for going up to the next level, you know. So long as the contract made between farmers and companies are like enforceable, so there will not be a a problem at, at all. Yeah. So. Yeah, thank you so much. I'd yeah. like to ask Peter. Peter, you had uh, a, a, a vertical in a CB bank. If there is a contract between a farmer and a corporate, uh, would the bank be able to extend uh, loans to the farmer against that contract? And also give us an idea that how do you safeguard yourself Again, somebody sort of uh, reneging on the contract in terms of paying the money back to you. Answering the question, I will assume that corporate refer to as the ultimate buyer or off ticker. Basically, off tickers they are the buyer of the, the the goods produced by the farmer. So most banks in Myanmar are not into direct agriculture financing, except most of the commercial bank, local bank or foreign bank, we will finance or fund the microfinance institution with, on SME level, but not directly to the farmer. 
So the point number three here is that depending on the credit profile of the corporate and the business plan, be it local or foreign, CB Bank can look into financing uh, such investment. However, we are looking into possibility of doing SME trade financing for agriculture product by offering the farmer some trade financing facility as follow. CB Bank financing. A. Farmland equipment required to use on the land. So we can finance farmland equipment. That is very important for the farmer to start enriching the farm for the eventual harvest. Pre-export financing, supply chain financing. If the land is used for processing agriculture produce, we also have packing loan. And uh, importantly, we also have invoice, warehouse receipt financing. You know, these are all very high risk thing you need experienced banker to handle as well as understanding how the structuring of this inventory or warehouse financing in terms of uh, uh, borrower using the receipt. Okay, so where the farmer or producer deposit the inputs grain into a warehouse and take the warehouse receipt to the bank as collateral for short-term loan. So this is another form of short-term loan to the farmer via the SME, okay? And uh, my number two question, your question number two, how do you safeguard yourself against non-payment arising due to genuine issues such as errant weather? My answer is that this uh, errant weather is one of the inherent risks in agriculture especially in agriculture financing, besides disease, pests, and so on. To safeguard myself, because the question asked me, how do you safeguard? So assuming I will want to safeguard myself. To safeguard myself, I will diversify across region or location, a basket of different crops, not just one type of crop, but different type of crops and feasibility Flexible repayment schedule tied to the farmer cash flow, perhaps even finance program across the value chain. Okay, offline uh, concerning this financing thing is not uh, so simple as what we are doing in the developed country or developing country. But for this uh, frontier country, those are underdeveloped country. They are yet to understand how the financing go about. More of the current financing are using the traditional method. So obviously the farmer, the hand are very tight, 100%, very difficult to do because they are controlled by all the different uh, big buyer. They are the one who, who are the actual player in the market, whether it be it bin or pulses or any agricultural product. The small farmer, they produce, they sell to them. They will go around during the harvest system to purchase from the farmer. So the farmer is at the mercy of this big uh, entrepreneur. So in terms of using the bank to penetrate into the farmer direct financing, it may take uh, many, many more years. Let us be very frank about it. This is not USA, this is not Europe. The farmer don't think like what the European or the American farmer are thinking with all the helps from the expertise of the, their own banker. Whereas in Myanmar, the, the situation is so different. Unless you really understand, then you can help the farmer to move in the correct direction. I think this, this conference is very, very crucial to awaken the giant, how we can help this farmer because Myanmar is an agriculture country. So why they are not exporting as much 
and it should be like India, for example. Being impulses is also competed. Uh, in India, you are also producing a lot, whereby you don't need, don't need even to buy from Myanmar. So the farmer will suffer. So basically, come back to the question, uh, what I have added in uh, of, of the answer, okay? Okay, agriculture, then always be a weather related. You need to have an insurance company, not small little company. Not small little insurance company would want to take on this kind of risk of uh, looking into agriculture financing. It's a very nice word to use. Agriculture financing, you know, you never think of the weather, how the weather affects the farmer. How this insurance going to take the risk? You know, insurance is basically taking your money to put into a pool of resources in case of community, they can pay the farmer. But now these insurance are thinking of making billions. You think they really care about the farmer? So now come back to the same question. Importantly, the insurance company, I will say, uh, of the, my answer is that the credit agency, credit export agency, this should be financed by the government or all the big bank, big local bank to come together to set up this export insurance uh, services, providing this kind of uh, taking of the risk for this kind of agriculture product. So if you ask an insurance company to take on the risk of this weather related or catastrophe risk, I don't think you want to take, all right? You talk about fraud, you talk about drug. Uh, Peter, let me just interrupt you here, if you don't mind. We have got Christopher Co with us. Okay. And he's actually <laughs> an expert on crop insurance. Okay. And uh, I'm going to ask him a few questions. So yeah, it's a very important point that you've raised on insurance. And we are lucky that we have right. somebody like Christopher on the panel with us. Okay. So yeah, I don't want to interrupt you, but... Uh, Okay, I, th I think it's fair because I think I also limit to 10 minutes. But then off the cuff, you know, sometimes uh, for the sake of answering the question can be very, very, uh, you know. Anyway, I go to my point number three. Huh? Okay, uh, number two. Lah, in fact, there need to be weather-related insurance to cover catastrophe. This scenario is likely. Insurance sector will have to look into this closely. Government might have to subsidize uh, during the initial day. All right, number three, for SME, we do land on unsecured basis, but subjected to a very tight scrutiny on their credit rating. So this is an, an challenging point. And number four, we would mitigate the risk by looking into experience of the farmer, farmer offering necessary support in the event where non-payment non-payment become an issue by various options. Example, deferred payment plan, emergency loan, etc. if required. Final point is that number five, we can also assist the customer by reviewing the contract entered into between them and their supplier. Also off taker to see who bear the risk of the iron weather, etc. or request for the government credit or guarantee scheme to make it easier for the farmer to obtain financing. Finish, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Very interesting. I think uh, what you said is that fin bank financing in Myanmar for agriculture is evolving. We are not at the point where we should be, but this is a slow process because both sides and the government have got to understand as to what the risks involved are, how to mitigate them, and you also raised a very important point on insurance. And fortunately, we have uh, Christopher Co of Aeon uh, Reinsurance Company with us. He spent all his working life uh, in crop insurance. And I'd like to ask Christopher, Christopher, when you look at crop insurance for a country like Myanmar, what sort of a package in terms of uh, a policy, in terms of a product, would you be able to offer? So over to you, Christopher. 
Um, thank you, Vatsal, and uh, thanks for inviting us on the panel. I, uh, I understand and sympathise with uh, Peter's uh, thoughts there. Um, so uh, it, 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 the first thing, I mean, you know, what, what we need for insurance is the first and most important thing is to get government buy-in, to get the government involved. Um, and that is because for so many reasons, which I will try and explain. So, you know, we need to get government buy-in. And the first reason is because we need, it's, insurance is the law of large numbers. You know, it, it's risk mitigation, it's diversification. And um, you know, if, we can get, if we can get large numbers, uh, we can uh, reduce the risk and therefore we could also reduce the premium. So uh, I, would, I would need the government to um, try and find a way to get large numbers and not just pockets of small insurance. I mean, for instance, so in Thailand in 2015, we had a one and a half percent penetration rate and the premium there was $13 per rye for rice insurance. This year, we've got a 40% penetration rate and that premium has come down to just over $3. So, you know, so if we can get, you know, explain to the government why they need to get involved to make it effective for them. All right. So that you keep it simple. Let's get them involved. Secondly, how can they do that? Um, we could learn from other countries. Um, insurance and finance sort of go hand in hand. And so why don't we try and suggest that? Um, so like the Myanmar Agricultural Development Bank, they've got a huge list of customers of, of these smallholder farmers uh, who they give loans to. So on the top of giving the loans, they can also sell the insurance. Again, that stops having to pay agents commission. And if you, you, know, you piggyback on the bank, on the MADB bank sales, the government owned, then then uh, that would keep the cost down, so make it more effective for the government. Um, so th you know, that kills us three birds uh, with one stone if we can get MADB involved, you know, because I see, I say they're already doing the, it. Um, they don't need to set up a separate distribution channel, and also they could, if the farmer has to pay anything, they could incorporate the insurance premium as part of the loan, and that obviously will be a fraction added onto the total loan, which um, if the farmer has to find the money on day one, that's obviously quite, could be quite difficult. But if it's incorporated as part of the loan that has to be paid back at the end of the period, once his, uh, he's made his sales, that makes it a lot more, lot more palatable for the farmer and less, uh, less economically stressful. Also, we need the government to have subsidized a premium. Now, you know, governments, you know, that, that sounds quite shocking, but actually in the world, 99% of the world's premiums are subsidized, crop insurance premiums are subsidized by governments. You look at somewhere in the US, um, even in the US, those huge uh, farms, you know, they're businesses, they're not farmers, they're businesses. The government subsidizes between 55 and 60% of their insurance premium. And if you were to go to somewhere like Thailand, many of the farmers there, um, the government subsidizes 100% of the premium. It is free for the farmers. So we need to get the, um, the government involved in, um, in, in, in setting up the scheme. Yeah, so uh, Christopher, thank you so much for that. But as far as Myanmar is concerned, can you give us an idea as to what sort of a product you can offer? Is it to cover rainfall yeah. deficiency? Yeah. Is it to cover earthquakes? The entire gamut here, thanks. Sure, yeah, uh, thanks, that's all. Um, I mean, and, and, you know, we've got to start with something simple. So, you know, for, for Myanmar, it, it, it would be relatively straightforward to do a rainfall insurance product. I mean, in India, they have found that uh, 90% of the reason for um, yield shortfall is because of uh, rainfall, whether it's excess rainfall or deficient rainfall. So um, to set up a rainfall insurance product, uh, that would be relatively straightforward. It would be, you would have a term sheet where you would have agreed triggers, uh, rainfall parameters for each crop in each area. And uh, these would vary around Myanmar, different uh, parameters. And then uh, you would measure the rainfall. Uh, either you could use the, um, uh, you know, the Manwa uh, Hydrology and Meteorological Department, or you could use, I mean, satellite data now is available widely. So you could use, a, you know, use a, an independent third party like satellite data to measure rainfall over the period of the growing season. If, uh, you know, at the end of the season, if there were uh, uh, de deficit rainfall, so there could be like a drought, uh, then there could be a payout to uh, sort of, to uh, uh, mirror the, the loss in the crop yields, or if you have uh, excess rainfall over a short period, which could be a, like a typhoon or you know, which could simulate a flood, there would be a payout because of a crop loss there. So um, it's, it's pretty straightforward to try and design a rainfall insurance product.
Thank you, Christopher. One more follow-up question for you, and this is a concern that you know uh, people in underdeveloped countries have. If a farmer was to pay a premium, and then there is an event which uh, asks for him for the insurance policy to be invoked, how does he get around to actually collecting the money? Because the insurance company is basically a faceless entity, and you know the fine print is never read by the farmer. And the fine print is thrown at the farmer to escape, you know, from paying the the insurance claim. Then how does that work? Can you give us a sense as to how the farmer can be protected? Um, well, that's right. I, I would say, I mean, it, 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 if the government is involved in financing the premium, um, you know, paying part of the premium, they have an interest to make sure that the farmer gets paid. So, first of all, um, the government involvement would um, would, you know. It's a reputational risk for the insurance company if they do renege on claims or don't pay claims. The, the, you know, the government involvement will make sure that they pay the claims. Secondly, um, you know, at the end of the day, it is the bank. The bank is going to be selling the policy and they just give a border row of so many farmers and so much sums insured uh, in this particular area. And um, and at the end of the, the period, that's some... Uh, that area will be checked against the term sheet to see if there is a claim or not. And then it's just paid paid by the uh, insurance company to the bank. So you've got big corporations involved like the bank and the government to keep the insurance companies honest. And we found that, uh, you know, the reputational risk with the uh, with the local governments, if the if the insurance companies uh, do not pay uh, is enough to keep them on track. Christopher, thank you so much. I think we've got a good sense now as to how an insurance uh, contract would work between the farmers and the company and how the claim can be collected. My next question is for Dr. Minzo. Dr. Minzo, you know, you're an expert here in Myanmar. You have heard uh, Peter as well as Christopher talk about banking and insurance. In your opinion, what are the chances for success for contract farming in an item like corn and pulses? Can you give us a sense of that? And also I'd like to ask you, as to whether there is any thinking within government circles to reach out to leading corporates internationally and invite them into the country for contract farming. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you all invite me to participate in the panel. Yeah, so for the first question, so in my view, the contract farming is defined as the uh, contract of protection between farmers and contractors company. Yeah, so now that they, if uh, they contract, make their contract properly according to the contract family law. So, and then uh, they can get the bank financing such as the seasonal loan or, or short term loan or loan with collateral. Yeah, so now uh, for the seasonal loan, so to farmers, they can get the bank financing by the depositing their ownership of land. Here called form seven and as a collateral to the bank and they can get a loan. Or, and then the proof letter, that is a recommendation letter that is given by the company or contractor uh, to the farmers. And then the, in that in that the letter, so we must state it, what is the commodity and then the quantity, what is the fixed price or predetermined price, and then the, what is the specification of the quality. Yeah, so, and then the, when is the crop harvest? And then the time of deliver, delivery. So they can get the bank financing from the bank. Yeah, for more safer to the bank. So all the participants also make the tripartite agreement among the farmers, contractors, and the bankers. Yeah, so, and then the, to the contractor, they can get the bank financing by the depositing the stock or the crops receiving all the collateral that are required by the bank depending yeah that's why the effort for the all participants to reduce the risk of the yeah, crop damage so they can buy the crop insurance yeah if this yeah available in myanmar in future that is my answer for first question so and then the number two question yeah, beside the corns, yeah, green bean and sesame seeds have been practiced as part of the, yeah, not 100% the control farming. 
Therefore, I like to explain briefly about the uh, green man bean. Yeah, what how we did to export the sprouting purpose in European market. Yeah, so now uh, we our country has been the exporting green man bean for sprouting to EU market since 2015. Last five years, EU Commission, yeah, EU countries, they found that Myanmar also produced the good quality for sprouting. Yeah, that's why they contact to the Ministry of Commerce and uh, our association, Myanmar Passes Beans Sesame Seeds Merchant Association, they are gather the interested companies or exporters to take part in this project. So, and then uh, they listed and uh, they sent a list to the EU Commission and then uh, also Ministry of Commerce. So this uh, listed companies, so went down to the plantation area of the green man bean in the Yango region, Kenyan Tongwa. So, and then the, each company gather the farmers as possible as they can, whoever they're interested to produce quality green man bean for EU market. So, and then the, we gather the, this uh, list of the farmers. And then the, these uh, farmers, how many acres they own, and then the, how many quantities they can produce, so we list it. And then they also submitted to the Minister of Commerce and sent to the yeah, EU again. Yeah, so and then uh, furthermore, we also appoint uh, one collector in that uh, respective area of the plantation. Yeah, this uh, collector, so have to responsibly to collect the cargoes in the specific quality. And then they also the pack, pack and transport these cargoes to the, our factory. Yeah, that is a collector site. So bef before 20 days prior to the plantation, so the EU Commission, yeah, assist the expert and technical assistance to the farmers, yeah, by the giving extension, collaborating with the yeah, Ministry of Commerce and Ministry of uh, Agriculture, uh, Agriculture, Livestock and Irrigation Department. Yeah, so and then the, they also give the extension to the farmer in the guidelines of GAP. Yeah, so and then the, they produce the crops. So and then the, we haven't the, fixed the price. So, so and then the, we also, when they harvest the crop, so we pay the more higher 500 to 1,000 just per basket. One basket equal to the 33 kg. So, and then the, we pay the premium to the farmers, but the quality will be met with the yeah, required specification of the green man bean to EU market. Yeah, so, and then, the, we, and then so the, for the collector and the processor, yeah, so the, the EU and the Ministry of Commerce, and then that they also give the yeah, training in the Office of the Ministry of Commerce. Yeah, so and then the, after that, the Department of the Plant Protection also assists to be successful in this project. So they send, they also go and check the processor warehouse to the respective company. Yeah, so and then the, they check and approve in the guideline of the GMP and then the GHP. Yeah, so and then the, after approving, by the, the plant protection, the respective companies allow to permit and process the green man bean and export the, this green man bean to the EU market. Yeah, that is a green man bean process. So, and then the, also the sesame seeds. So now the, the sesame seeds, last three years back, so SDDF, Standard Trade Development Fund under the ITC, the yeah, International Trade Council. So exists to improve the quality in guideline with GAP, yeah, good, good, good agriculture practice to the farmers. So and then the Department of Agriculture under the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, Livestock and Irrigation, they also exist to farmer to grow black sesame seeds. So, but the difference thing with the 
green mung bean is dead. So they harvest the crops and then that they collectively send to the one third party. They appoint the agent. This agent separate the quality grading for the in, in specification of the quality. Yeah, so and now they, they separate the quality grading lot by lot. So and then the, the, this uh, party also invite local traders, exporters, and then the, also the buyer directly to participate in the light auction. So and then the, they sell collectively one day. So how many bags in lot by lot totally? So the winner take all the lot at a different price depending on the quality. There is a different thing in the practice in our country. Yeah, last three years, but still they now. This a systemic process. Therefore, we have already, yeah, so practice like this. Therefore, the, if uh, we can develop the contract farming systematically and conveniently, so there are the more advantages and benefits to farmers as well as to the contractors, definitely. Yeah, so and then the, and that, def, thus there are many variety of the passes and beans can be produced in our country. Yeah, but they, they are related to fit with the weather in the plantation area of our, our country. That is a very important thing to investor. Yeah, so and then, the, then I can suggest the more potential crops to, to make a contract farming in our country are black eye bean, red kidney beans, red bamboo beans, chickpea, and uh, also azuki. Yeah, these are also good potential, good potential to invest, to grow in our country. That's a uh, number two answer. Yeah, so, and then uh, another question is uh, number three. The role of the government is a very important because so they can enable to enable the contract by law or not and monitor the con contract farming between all the participants by the terms and condition of the contract farming contract farming that uh, that mentioned in the contract. Yeah, in line with the stakeholders participatory monitoring system in our country. That is very important. So, and then uh, also they can give the legal advice to the farmers and then uh, also uh, our contractors or company, private companies to invest here. So another thing is uh, issue the certification. That is also very important. So the certification of the yeah, Form 7, that is the uh, ownership of the land to farmers and then also GAP certification to farmers. So, and then uh, also certification for the exporters. That is a phytosanitary certificate and then the Form E, Form D, and then the quality of, uh, certificate of qualities. Yeah, that is uh, important for the, our contractors or exporters. On the other hand, so government must be yeah, upgrade the laboratory, which is uh, in line with the international accredited standard, so that we can check, we can test the quality. For example, pesticide residue, residue chemical residue, and then the quality that required by the market or buyers, and then also heavy metals like this. Yeah, that is very important. Certification of the origin. That is also issued by the Ministry of Commerce, Form E, Form D, and then also the Form AI, Form AC. Yeah, that is also the buyers get the special preferential tariff in their country if uh, they buy from our country. So now uh, also cooperate, cooperating country with the ASEAN. 
so we can use that this uh, certification of origin to get the special preparation tariff. Therefore, in my in my conclusion, yeah, so the the contract family law and then the SOPs. SOP for the yeah, contract family, and then the seed law has been approved and released in our country. Therefore, we have uh, so many opportunities, beneficial in investing in our process and being sector in our country. Yeah, that's why, yeah, so I invite you all to warmly to invest in this our sector yeah so i say let's cooperate and grow together for mutual prosperous future thank you all thank you sir thank you very much that was very informative i'd like to go across to david david you heard uh, the various panel participants and no matter how many things you put on a contract there are still so many things that cannot be put on a contract you know which come which you experience when you are actually going through the execution of the contract. You have experience of, uh, you know, dealing with farmers and you also know as to what sort of, uh, you know, issues can come up while dealing in a contract farming agreement. Can you give us an idea as to what are the issues that, which may not be on a contract, but, but which are day-to-day -day issues that we need to be careful about? And the reason why I ask you this question is that people who do want to engage into an agreement of this sort, they need to know as to, you know, what the issues they may face would be. So we just want a sense of that, if you can uh, just let us know. Thank you. Okay, so the day-to-day -day issues that, that we've experienced with regards to contracts are a few. Um, number one, there's always the risk of poachers. I like to call them poachers. Uh, the guys who like to come in when the crop is grown and they like to find out what the crop is contracted at and offer more money above the contract. And I can tell you it's only through relationship building and experience will you be in a situation that your farmers will stay loyal to you. Because for every, for every poacher out there, I would say there's, there's a farmer who's prepared to risk that contract uh, and uh, sell it for the higher price. That's one issue. Uh, another issue, but I see it as a, a, a positive and a negative. There's always market volatility in, in all of these commodities. But with regards to the contracts, the, the, the positive is that you can do your planning and you know whether you get paid a dollar and the market goes to a dollar ten you at least know where you stand at the beginning of your season. It allows you to, to budget. It allows you to, to plan ahead. Um, of course, the, the plus side is you can have a market that goes to 90 cents for a commodity and you're still getting your $1. Um, of course, then there's the risk of, as the, the, the guys in, uh, discussed with regards to their insurance, uh, with regards to contract growing, there's, there's, there can be an occasion where a farmer's going to claim that he didn't get acceptable weather and he got too much rain, not enough rain. And then you, as the, uh, as the so-called owner of that contract, you're sort of scratching your head and thinking, well, how are you going to prove whether this is the truth or not the truth? Um, and again, you know, each season ultimately presents itself with different challenges. This is agriculture. This isn't a production line where everything is coming off at the same rate in the same space in the same appearance, et cetera, et cetera. Every single season presents itself with different uh, um, issues with regards to contract farming. But again, you know, it, it comes back to the situation which I've alluded to a number of times. And that is the only way I believe contract farming becomes sustainable and, and reliable is once there's a level of trust that's been uh, established between, between the, the two parties and that lets the relationships evolve. And the thing about those relationships evolving is it's always going to open up new opportunities. If you've been growing green mung beans with a, with a farmer for 20 years and he's got a suitable growing area for another type of commodity, 
he's going to have more comfort listening to you asking him to plant something else other than what you've been doing. So for me, ultimately, that's the, the key to contract farming is the relationship between the two contracting parties. You know, it's, it's perhaps an old school thought process uh, in, in a modern world, but I believe strongly in that. And I think that's, that's really and truly the way that contract farming is going to be uh, sustainable in any environment. David, thank you so much. I really like that bit about poaching. I mean, something of yeah. this sort, you know, is only possible to know from, from a person who's really done it himself. And I think uh, this was a fair bit of education for everybody on the panel. And also people who are going to be listening to this uh, on the 30th of Jan. Okay, my last question is to Shaunak. Shaunak, can you give us an idea as to what sort of legal battles you typically see uh, happening in a contract farming agreement? And also, can you give us an idea as to whether in most cases, do people really litigate because the amounts involved may be too small or because they don't want to upset the relationship with the contracting party? Or do they actually litigate uh, no matter what the amount be? Just want a sense of that. Thank you. Sure, Vatsal. See, I wanted to uh, also just follow up a little bit up upon what uh, Dr. Zhao said and what uh, David said. You know, I was, uh, I got the statistics from uh, this Australian Journal of Agriculture and Resource, where they published uh, data from uh, around uh, a ground survey of 600 uh, lentil farmers from Nepal. Uh, the survey was conducted by the Food and Policy Research Institute in uh, partnership with the Arizona State University. And uh, the survey basically found that contract farmers achieve the highest revenue per hectare with the lowest cost per hectare and the highest yield per hectare, resulting in the highest profit per hectare and the highest overall wealth for the farmers as compared to farmers who are not engaged in contract farming. This was based on the on the ground survey and not, and, and they look at not just uh, what is being grown. They also look at the methodology that is being used while doing the growing. Like what is the fertilizer? What quality of seeds do you use? How often do you, uh, you know, irrigate and so on and quality checks at each stage. You know, if you look at India, we've had contract farming, uh, you know, by PepsiCo, by McDonald's, you know, McDonald's, the lettuce that they use in their uh, burger is invariably grown locally. McDonald's does not use lettuce grown in the US for the burgers that they sell here in India. They use lettuce that is grown in India, right here in the backyard from where your McDonald's is situated. And what McDonald's has achieved for growing their local produce with contract farmers is unimaginable. They have long-term contracts with the contract farmer and they ensure that the just-in-time delivery takes place to ensure the freshness of the product at the time of, uh, so, so that the time between harvesting and the time between actual consumption is minimized. So it's even possible, you know, like we always like to criticize fast food chains, but it's even possible that you get a fresher and a much better healthier quality burger at McDonald's than you can make at home. So, you know, that's, that's the, that's the way that they manage it. And it's just like a factory. So they try to manage their, their farms like a factory so that what you achieve is the most optimum and the best outcome, which results in a better outcome for everyone. Now to answer your question, what are the typical sorts of disputes? You know, because the, because the type of contract farming, as David mentioned, you know, there could be sort of like a, a pure buyer seller kind of situation, right? If that is the situation, then the, then the disputes would be slightly narrower in terms of quality, price, timeline for delivery, and the like. But if you have a broader sort of engagement where, where the company is providing technology, know-how, uh, the methodology of farming, 
and is has a greater sort of involvement in execution there the disputes would be far lower because what happens is the company is involved at almost every stage so you know for example you know they would have someone who would go and check that uh all the you know seeds that are used are correctly sown and the fertilizer that's that's being given is is correctly being used and so on and if if the company is greater involved in the process of farming they are not going to then go go around and challenge the outcome like they they're going to they're going to stand by the process that they have collaborated with the farmer to undertake and that's that's going to be helpful for the farmer as well because he doesn't want to have the risk he doesn't want to say okay no look i don't want to have this risk of uh you know not being able to sell my crop or whatever so the company will say well okay you you know you use our processes we we'll tell you how to go about doing everything and if you do it as per what we tell you we are giving you a guarantee that we'll buy it so it helps both the both the parties you know and that's how disputes are sort of reduced then another way of reducing the disputes would be to use form contracts like you know you have a gafta and fosfa contracts but those are obviously for traders but the similar sort of concept would work in a contract farming space because you have standardized terminology standardized uh um you know practices standardized quality standardized timelines because you know if one farmer is growing lentils he's going to be growing it at the same time as everyone else is growing lentils so the terms and conditions that are applicable for one buyer to buy lentils is going to be similar in terms of uh, all of those parameters with everyone else you know you are you're not going to uh, as a buyer you're not going to say okay i'll buy the best quality lentils from you but as far as you are concerned i'm i'm okay buying bad quality lentils you are going to be looking for a certain quality parameter if all of the if if the form contracts are set up in such a way to ensure that those quality parameters have been taken care of the disputes would be significantly reduced so th- that's where you know as i mentioned to you alternative dispute resolution comes into play when you have contracts that are so standardized and you have alternative dispute resolution mechanisms in place you know the involvement of the government becomes lesser and lesser so you know you you reduce uh disputes you make it beneficial for the farmer and you also make it beneficial for the company by doing that and you provide certainty to everyone which would be better for uh you know someone like chris or even uh, peter because it gives you a more um uh, it gives you a greater level of confidence in the system to be able to finance it to be able to ensure risk it gives everyone a clearer picture when everyone knows what's going on and there's data available to everyone so that's something that really the you know is for the government to make this enabling a uh, framework for every for all the participants to be uh, you know having a higher level of confidence in what they are doing so that they don't have to at the end of the day you know obviously no one likes to get into a dispute no one wants to have a dispute everyone wants to try to avoid a dispute and create certainty so by doing all of this the level of disputes really come down and you know that's that's really what the government should be uh, aiming for to go on to your next question um, does it always make sense to litigate you know that's a very good question and there are some corporates who would make it a policy to litigate everything whether it's you know uh, $1000 or whether it's $10000 or whether it's a million dollars they will litigate everything um you know that is that is really i would say a, a very aggressive a uh, kind of uh, strategy and uh, you know some companies do that some companies don't do it but what is seen from my experience is that uh, the really big companies they have you know a certain uh, monetary th- threshold where they would say look if the claim is above uh, $5000 we litigate it if it's below $5000 we don't litigate it and that makes sense from the company perspective as well because the company is looking at preserving its own image right today if i am uh, representing a company 
and uh, you know we haven't gotten what we have contracted for then we are, we are just not going to let it go like it doesn't make sense for us to do that because if we let this one instance where we did not get what we contracted for go there's going to be you know everyone is going to do the same thing and we we have to be taken seriously in the marketplace you can't be looked at as a company where no one really bothers about what you've contracted for and uh you know they take you for a ride you have to make sure that people perform on their contracts and you know the farming community is very is very tightly knit there's lots of cooperative farms there's a lot of uh, you know internal efficiency of communication between the farmers so you know if today if there's one contract and i don't enforce upon it and if i let it go you know within a week within 10 days all the farmers are going to know about it it's not going to be a secret everyone would tell everyone look you know there was this one contract with this big company and you know we didn't do it and you know we got away with it so you know in in 10 days i'm going to have a situation where everyone who i have contracts with is going to try to you know get away with something on the other and people will start thinking well no this guy he doesn't really bother you know he's got big pockets he's not going to litigate so that's not how it works really because then if if it's one contract fine it may not hit your bottom line a lot but if it becomes 10 contracts 20 contracts 50 contracts then you know that then then company solvency comes into place you know is it really make sense to does it really make sense to do business like that i don't think so so you know companies look at preserving their reputation by by ensuring that whatever they have contracted for they get it and if they really do feel that there is no point in entering into this contract that because it's not going to be enforceable at a future date or while they are entering into the contract they know that they can't enforce upon that contract then invariably all the big companies will definitely take protection against that you know if it's a credit risk the big companies if they feel that they are not going to be able to uh ensure that the you know counterparty is credit worthy they will take credit risk insurance if they feel that there is a payment issue or whatever they would they will insist on an lc if they still feel that there is some other issue they will protect themselves by asking for an advance they will you know uh, get a foreign bank somewhere in some uh you know tax haven in luxembourg or something to take on the risk and you know they will mitigate their risk they are experts at that it's not about you know the co- companies will not take on risk that they do not want to take they will only take the risk that they are comfortable taking and really the big risks are almost always hedged no com uh, just you know like chris said you know weather and uh, default risk all of these risks are mostly hedged you know so it, it that's that's really you know answers your question as to whether a big company would really litigate or not shona thank you so much i think we got a fair idea as to you know how a company can protect itself number one is you have a form as far as the contracts are concerned so everything is standardized to the extent possible and secondly what you mentioned was that a large company will make sure that the counterparty delivers on the contract because if they allow that person to go scot free then it will become a a problem on a massive scale so thank you so much participants for this uh, interaction with all of you i think anybody who watches this in myanmar would know as to you know what they need to do in terms of having a correct contract in place in terms of safeguarding themselves as to what risks are insurable what risks are able to be passed on to somebody else like a corporate and uh, with this we we come to the close of the session and once again thank you everybody ตนอ่ะเดี๋ยวไงบ่าโกโกตื้นหมดเลยเว้ยเสียเดียวบ่าตนอ่ะท่านขอใช้มาโกโกตื้นหมดเลยเว้ยเสียเดียวตนอ่